Let me start by uh, introducing myself and uh, this session. And then as quickly as possible, I will uh, uh, get our great panel that we have on board with us here uh, uh, to, uh, to engage. So my name is Morten Høgnesen. Uh, I am DRC's Global Advisor for Innovative Financing. Um, I have this great opportunity to moderate this panel on the sustainable business case for connectivity. Um, to those of you who have been with us all day, um, what a day. Uh, there has been a lot to process. Um, I myself uh, have a table full of notes here in front of me, and I will try to, uh, to make sense of that uh, uh, as we go along uh, through this session. By way of really quickly introducing the panel, that I have here with me. Uh, we have uh, Erica Perez from UNHCR. We have Josephine Melissa from the APC. We have Robin Miller uh, from Dalberg. And then we were at least supposed to have uh, Isaac Kwame from the GSMA. I have not seen his, uh, 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 his uh, face yet here uh, on the screen, but uh, hopefully he will be uh, joining us shortly. Um, the way we will run this session is what I would like to call conversational style. Um, so I will briefly set the scene, then hand over to each of the panelists for a quick introduction, who they are, their organization, why they find this topic uh, interesting uh, and important. Um, and then we'll have a conversation around uh, three uh, overall headings. One being, when we talk about connectivity, if we get practical and focus on the successes, what are the good use cases that we have out there where connectivity has actually been successfully provided uh, to displacement affected communities or otherwise uh, underserved or unconnected uh, communities. Then transitioning from there, if we have these successes, um, but we're not seeing them everywhere. Uh, why could that be? What are the challenges? What are the pain points? And then we'll end up at the heading of this session, sustainable business cases or business models for enhancing connectivity in the future, trying to explore a little, what is it that we need to do uh, uh, individually as organizations? And more importantly, I think uh, together uh, to get more uh, connectivity in place uh, for those who don't currently have access to it. So I won't spend much more time on setting the scene other than to say throughout this day and those who have been for sort of that whole global event journey that we have uh, uh, been on as, as DRC on digitalization over the past couple of months, um, what we have seen and heard is to a large degree, when you are connected, what can you do? jobs, education, health, communications, linking up with family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We heard uh, uh, Benjamin from, from TechFugees this morning saying everything is digital. Uh, um, but to have everything that is digital, uh, uh, you need to be connected uh, uh, one way or another. Um, and that is uh, what we're here to discuss. How can we make that? Uh, that happen. A little bit of housekeeping uh, uh, before uh, we jump uh, into it, and I'll hand over uh, to the panel. Um, you have the chat available uh, to the right of your screen. Uh, feel free to ask questions there to the panelists anytime uh, during the conversation. Um, we'll pick them up uh, either as we go along, but more likely uh, towards the end, uh, we'll carve out a little bit of time uh, to uh, uh, to spotlight some of those questions as, as part of the conversation. So without much further ado, we have uh, 50 minutes uh, left and we have a lot of ground to cover and uh, so much uh, expertise available. Uh, so uh, uh, let's, uh, let's get started. And we'll start off with a quick round of each panelist introducing themselves two or three minutes, who you are, your organization's work, 
and why you find this topic uh, uh, interesting and important. So, so top of my screen uh, is, is you, uh, Erica. Uh, so uh, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Morten. Good morning, good afternoon, um, colleagues, and thank you for the participants who joined this session. For UNHCR, it's a, it's a pleasure to be represented here. My name is Erika Perez Iglesias. I'm part of UNHCR Innovation Service based out of Panama. I'm currently leading on the Digital Inclusion Program here in the Americas. Um, this program aims at ensuring that refugees and the communities that host them have the right and the choice to be included in a connected society and also that their voices are heard during the design and implementation of humanitarian initiatives that impact them. Um, our work here in the region covers like a series of, of areas that goes from research and understanding a little bit better um, the roadblocks or the barriers that refugees and migrants are facing to be um, included digitally, um, to advocacy with key stakeholders um, in the region and also globally with the rest of my team um, to mitigate those, those barriers. And we are also offering um, support to UNHCR operations and community-based organizations um, to tackle directly some of the digital challenges that they uh, encounter in their respective operations um, and facilitate the inclusion of, of refugees and migrants. So as you know, um, connectivity and digital technologies are shaping the way we do business, that we interact uh, with government, with humanitarian organizations, that we access services like healthcare, education, and even the way that we interact with, with each other and loved ones. Um, so we consider those as some of the key um, aspects of the social evolution that we are living. Um, the Americas is, is a context characterized by uh, mixed population flows um, of people uh, for which connectivity represents um, a lifeline. Um, this is, you know, being able to access uh, like reliable information, verifying um, data, making informed decisions along the way, um, accessing local services and opportunities in their hosting countries, and all of this underpinning their, their self-reliance. So the role that connectivity has in humanizing the humanitarian response is what drives me the most to continue working in this space, um, ensuring that vulnerable populations such as uh, refugees and migrants are not left behind. Over to you, Morten. Wonderful, Erica. Thank you so much and great to have you with us. Uh, so uh, from uh, Panama and on to uh, Nairobi, uh, Josephine uh, Melissa from the Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, uh, welcome. Welcome to the panel and uh, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Morten. It's great to be here today. Um, as introduced, I'm Josephine Meliza. I work with the Association of Progressive Communication uh, on a project called Connecting the Unconnected, um, Connecting the Unconnected, uh, which is being implemented in partnership with Rhizomatica. The project aims to contribute uh, to an enabling ecosystem uh, for the emergence and growth of community networks and other community-based connectivity initiatives in developing countries. We work in, um, in Africa, Asia, and LAC. Uh, and in Africa, it's uh, countries such as Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, Malawi, Uganda, um, and DRC, uh, but uh, also supporting uh, work in other African countries as well. Uh, so our work, um, as mentioned, is around supporting bottom-up connectivity initiatives, um, mostly uh, by communities. Um, and uh, this is because uh, over the last decade, we've seen the growth of um, the first mile um, with an increase in terms of the undersea cables connecting the continent. Uh, we've also seen growth in terms of the middle mile um, with fiber optic cable. But uh, the main challenges are around the um, last mile connectivity. Um, in Africa, we see those challenges in uh, in rural areas, in remote areas, uh, and also uh, for refugee communities uh, where um, uh, it's quite challenging uh, to offer affordable access. So we believe that uh, it's time to explore alternative uh, or complementary access models such as community networks because they are not only 
build the capacity of communities to build their own digital infrastructure, but it also ensures that uh, communities are able to uh, develop um, and use technologies uh, based on their needs uh, and, and their needs and priorities. And so we think that uh, they can community networks can play an important role in meeting the needs of uh, refugees for better connectivity. Thank you so much, uh, Josephine, and definitely looking forward to exploring uh, 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 such community-led initiatives uh, uh, further on uh, in the session. Um, I was wondering if if it would be possible to put your uh, camera on uh, uh, later on. Maybe there's a technical glitch or something, but then there would be uh, some of my colleagues available to 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 assist with that. Um, from uh, uh, from from Josephine, I think we'll uh, we'll go to uh, uh, to you, Robin, uh, uh, as I see you uh, active on my screen. Uh, uh, Robin Miller uh, from Dalberg, welcome welcome to the panel, uh, uh, and over to you. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, uh, to those uh, who are joining us. And uh, of course, you may have seen the little box of mine go in and out um, as the, the perfect irony would have it. Of course, I was having trouble staying connected. So um, pleasure to meet everyone. As uh, Morton mentions, my name is Robin Miller. I'm a partner with Dahlberg, where I lead our work in a digital transformation uh, and the role of data in building inclusive uh, economies around the world. Um, what this has really meant for me over the past few uh, t few years and and why I'm excited to join this conversation is um, at the start, I've spent a lot of time looking at what often gets described as the as the future of work. Um, for me, this is the intersection between uh, digital transformation. So, how do we bring uh, both the infrastructure um, as as well as the uh, meaning the the access that moves us from just access to to connectivity to meaningful use of connectivity that enables our lives and enables the uh, effectiveness of economies, enables um, opportunities for growth. Um, with the intersection of uh, human capital and the potential of human capital and really understanding what more can we do to recognize the skills and, and capabilities that, that people have uh, across our societies today, um, how we bring those to bear um, in, in building new opportunities for, for our economies and the provision of social services, as well as the growth of industries um, that is both um, uh, uh, economically attractive for, for growth um, and, and meaningful uh, to ensure uh, inclusion, um, inclusion and, and, and continued prosperity. So, so for me, there's this, um, this, this sort of intersection between digital transformation and bringing out the best in, in human capital around the world. Uh, in particular to this conversation, I'm, I'm, I'm quite uh, looking forward to it because, and I know this term has been used before and given that we're, you know, kind of going into or part, mostly the way through the, the COVID crisis, but um, there's something perverse about the value of this crisis that I've seen over um, the past few years. And what I mean by that is I've been working uh, with governments, um, with private sector technology companies, both big global technology giants, as well as early innovative startups um, that are really shaping this landscape. And the one thing I've seen is a real appetite for both the urgency of responding um, to this global crisis that we all have a shared uh, investment in, in, in serving and supporting each other, um, but also a f a, an openness to taking more risk, to being more innovative, to being more flexible. And I think so those are some of the characteristics that will um, help us to both respond to the immediate um, uh, needs that we see, um, but also build that kind of lasting um, uh, sort of system and infrastructure for the futures so that we can continue to bring uh, less included and, and more uh, isolated or uh, underserved, underrecognized um, uh, potential, uh, you know, communities and, and potential to the table. So looking forward to the conversation. Let me pause there and hand back to you, Martin. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Robin, and, and, and great to have you here. And uh, Isaac, uh, uh, you uh, are with us uh, now, and uh, we are very happy with that. Uh, 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 Isaac uh, Kwame from, from GSMA, uh, over to you for a quick introduction. 
Thank you, Martin. Hello, everyone. It's nice to meet you all and looking forward to this amazing session today. Uh, my name is Isaac Kwame. I work for GSMA Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation Programs. I lead the Strategic Partnerships and Market Engagement Unit. Um, the role of that specific unit is to build lasting, sustainable partnerships between uh, humanitarian organizations and mobile network operators, as well as other uh, technology partners within the mobile ecosystems. And these projects and sustainable partnerships are built at the last mile or at the grassroots level, um, with aim to catalyze adoption of uh, mobile enabled uh, technology to accelerate uh, humanitarian aid delivery. Um, so far, um, we have several uh, strategic partnerships across um, the globe and work in over uh, nine countries uh, in all geography, Africa, um, Asia, as well as uh, um, Eastern, East, Eastern Europe and Middle East. Um, GSMA, as you know, is um, has represented the interest of mobile network operator for over 30 years. Uh, it has over 750 um, net mobile network operators members, as well as of 400 of uh, the tech companies within the mobile ecosystem. Um, if you've ever heard about a mobile world congress that runs every uh, February um, in Barcelona. That's one of the flagship of the events that uh, GSMA uh, headlines um, for all the community within the mobile technologies as well as um, other others within the same ecosystem. Uh, and for mobile humani mobile for humanitarian innovation programs, um, as I said, the focus is on accelerating the delivery and the impact of digital humanitarian assistance. And uh, we do this in three parts. Think through research and insight, do through impact of project and strategic partnership as well as innovation funds, and advocate by removing barrier or advise removal of barriers to help drive changes at the last mile. Um, our Currently we have about five main um, pillars that sustain this model um, or area of activities. We look at mobile enabled utility harnessing, mobile enabled off-grid energy and water innovation to improve the lives of displaced people, uh, food security and climate change. Um, look at mobile solution for food security adaptation and resilience to climate change, digital identity, uh, leveraging mobile and uh, mobile technology to address identification challenges in humanitarian contexts and bring individuals and uh, to access life and enhancing services in their own name and in addition to that we also look at gender and inclusivity explore how um, mobile can enable solution that can reduce uh, gender gap and access to digital humanitarian services and enhance accessibility and uh, or accessibility and of those assistance uh, and then mobile financial services accelerating the provision of mobile financial services to enable digital and cash transfer to support livelihoods and resilience um, in that shape it gives you the overview of um, what the, the work of mobile for humanitarian innovation program focuses on but in addition to that is you know um gsma representing the interest of all mobile network operators connectivity at, is at the heart of uh, what we do and to be more specific mobile enabled connectivity is at heart of of what we do and personally in my Previous role, I, I worked for various organizations, including World Vision International, Net Hope, and one of the key roles was to drive access to connectivity to those who have been displaced. And some of these examples will be highlighted as we move forward with the discussion. So looking forward to it. Over to you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Isaac. And uh, um, how to start? Um, I think. Um, We have various reasons or various ways of, of, of thinking about uh, uh, being connected. Uh, um, and, and some of them have, have been explored today 
um, and I think on on this panel uh, uh, we've already heard about uh, uh, community-led initiatives, uh, uh, sort of mobile network uh, operator-led uh, initiatives. Uh, we've heard throughout the day a couple of examples also of sort of uh, private internet service providers uh, 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 stepping in and solving some of these issues. And I think I think we should we should start this panel uh, uh, by by highlighting some of the use cases that that you have come across in your work of of where this has actually worked where have we set up something uh, that wasn't there before uh, that that actually uh, uh, enabled uh, connectivity uh, uh, for people um, and Josephine I see you have your uh, uh, camera on and and so if, if I may use this opportunity uh, 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 to welcome you uh, again and and invite you to to share some of the uh, work that that APC has been doing around the community-led initiatives. Great, uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, sorry about the technical challenge before. Uh, yeah. So in terms of the work that we have been doing in community networks, um, the focus I uh, think has been around uh, mapping out what it will take to uh, start, uh, operate, and sustain a community network. Uh, so our work involves, um, there's the financial support, there's the um, policy support, capacity building, uh, support to this community network. So in sharing examples about um, where community networks have worked, uh, before, uh, during my introduction, there was the, um, the slide on uh, community networks, uh, some examples of community networks in Africa, uh, where you could see one in DRC, another in uh, in Uganda, and then we also have one um, quite several in South Africa, but in that case was uh, Zenzeleni in South Africa. Um, and just uh, briefly, because I know there are some people in the room who do not understand how community networks operate and they are started, um, is that majority of these networks are usually started uh, or initiated by a champion. So the champion can be from the community or someone um, who is external. Uh, so in the example of Pamojanet in DRC, it was initiated by uh, the local king um, or traditional leader uh, known as Amwami. Uh, Zenzeleni Community Networks in South Africa has its roots uh, from university researchers in collaboration with the local community. And then we have Bosco Uganda, uh, which has its roots uh, in the Catholic Church, started at a time when uh, Northern Uganda had the, the civil war. Uh, models vary from one community to another. Um, we have community networks that have cooperative models, uh, such as the ones in Tanzania. We have Kondoa, a community network in Tanzania. Uh, South Africa uh, is a mesh between non-for-profit and also cooperatives. And then um, in DRC, in Nigeria, in, um, in Zimbabwe, um, we see uh, where uh, it's community-based organizations as well as not-for-profit. But there's also the evolution uh, of community radios to now uh, start provisioning uh, internet, which is the case of Macha in, in Zimbabwe, sorry, Macha in Zambia. But in all these instances, the key uh, most important thing is the support, uh, local support, uh, community ownership. As you mentioned before, as in Zeleni has strong uh, roots uh, with, um, with the local leaders, uh, with the local tribal authorities, and similarly to, uh, to the one in DRC. Um, in terms of technologies used, uh, community networks mostly utilize uh, Wi-Fi uh, technologies, and this is because um, uh, it's readily, sort of readily available and cheaper. Uh, over time, uh, we've seen because um, Wi-Fi operates in the unlicensed spectrum, there's, be, there's been quite a lot of innovation around that instance. Um, and so in the deployment, in the building, in the, in the maintenance of the network, this is actually done uh, by the local communities. In some instances, this capacity already exists, but in other instances, they support external support. Uh, maybe you get experts uh, coming to build capacity and then it's taken over uh, by the community. Uh, one of the challenges that we have in Africa is around um, access to grid electricity. Um, so in the case of Uganda, 
uh, the network uh, is fully powered by by solar and in addition to that they have been able to also uh, build their own um, uh, solar grids um, one for six kilowatts and then two for 30 kilowatts that don't just power the network but uh, also support local businesses and schools um, and then there's the aspect that's very important around we are not just um, about building our consumers of technologies but you also want uh, when communities come online they have the capacity uh, they have the skills so that um, they are able to this network or connectivity serves their needs and priorities uh, so community networks are also actively involved in terms of building digital uh, capacities as well as um, as local content uh, working with different um, partners uh, as seen in in Malawi, where they have collaborated with the ministry, uh, with the ministry of um, of education, so there's quite I think a lot of experience in terms of the success, um, in terms of successful community networks that have been deployed, and uh, actually they exist despite of an enabling policy and regulatory environment, which we are hoping will change soon. Uh, but we also see this model working um, for refugees as well and, and their host communities. Um, and just to contextualize this, actually Bosco Uganda was started um, during the insurgency. Uh, and with the, the aim at uh, when they started was to provide connectivity to the IDP camps. But as uh, the civil war ended and communities resettled back, the network uh, also followed uh, the communities themselves. So it provides connectivity uh, within um, uh, some of the camps that are remaining uh, and also within the community itself. So it's quite a vast network that uh, spans over 400 kilometers, has over 54 centers. Um, and this is what we see when there's also collaboration between um, the, the local uh, organizations that um, um, local organizations and refugees and host communities. Thank you, thank you, Josephine. I, I think uh, I think it's, it's incredibly interesting examples that you're bringing out there. Uh, uh, not least uh, because it it makes uh, very clear uh, uh, that these things uh, don't just uh, fall out of the sky and then all of a sudden uh, uh, people people are connected. You mentioned. Uh, investments in electricity, you mentioned uh, the need also to look at the ability to actually use the services that are set up. You talk about all the important soft components around sort of community mobilization and ownership, et cetera, et cetera, uh, things that we can we can explore uh, also uh, with the with the other uh, panelists here. I want to to hand over to, to you, uh, Eric, as I know you have uh, also been working on on uh, community-led initiatives but but also from a, a different standpoint also of course as a, as a humanitarian organization um, uh, and perhaps you can share uh, uh, a few examples uh, uh, from 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 your experience where where we've actually been successful in in in, in connecting uh, in connecting the unconnected Absolutely, Morten, thank you. Um, so for UNHCR offering comprehensive connectivity solutions or working in, in these comprehensive connectivity solutions for the communities is paramount to, to ensure sustainability and also to maximize the, the use of services. Um, some of the examples that we can we can share with you today uh, is, for example, partnering um, with mobile network operators uh, to extend their current infrastructure to areas where, where refugees and, and other displaced populations are. Um, this was the case of Uganda and Tanzania, where we joined forces, for example, with the GSMA uh, to present uh, the MNOs with a uh, basically like a business case um, for them um, in order to consider expanding the infrastructure to, to refugee camps. So it um, was a matter of presenting um, this opportunity as, you know, uh, an, like an explore market and conquer it and consider refugees as um, as customers. Um, another another example that I would like to, to share with you, and this was a consequence of, of the pandemic and the lockdown that we all suffer, um, 
was the extension of the provision of um, connectivity services in urban areas, um, also to neighborhoods or to areas uh, that were more populated by refugees and migrants, like it was in the case of Quito in, in Ecuador. Like in many, in many occasions, like local authorities have ongoing connectivity initiatives, basically to provide um, connectivity services in public areas, um, but not always covering uh, those areas densely populated by by refugees and migrants. So UNHCR advocated and worked together um, with the authority in Lima to extend uh, these services um, during the pandemic uh, to these most underserved areas. So uh, refugees uh, and migrants could still uh, co be connected um, and communicate with humanitarian organizations, with loved ones and allowing children uh, to continue their education online. Um, and another another work stream that we are working and investing more and more on our community networks, as, as Josephine was explaining. Um, these have a strong community component, um, designing and installing um, basically the networks uh, with the communities itself, like creating a like a sense of uh, community ownership right from the beginning, which is um, basically paramount to, to ensure that these uh, type of solutions are going to be sustained in time. Um, the UNHCR has ongoing initiatives of this nature in South Sudan, um, in Burkina Faso and Colombia at the moment. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the Colombia example as it's a bit closer to my heart. Um, so in the northern part of, of Colombia, um, it's called La Guajira, it's one of the most um, underserved areas of the country and one of the main entry points for, for Venezuelan um, into Colombia. Uh, and now uh, Venezuelans are organizing themselves in informal settlements around the border area, and these, um, these settlements are not covered um, by the uh, local service providers, or they are having very unreliable connectivity. Um, also, these, um, the main population of that area are YU um, indigenous communities uh, with their own needs. Um, and recently, the government of uh, Colombia has launched a regularization process um, for those Venezuelans in the country um, that basically has to be started online. Uh, so we were wondering how are we making sure that these vulnerable populations are not further marginalized and we are um, offering an opportunity for them um, to initiate these processes, continue their education online um, and also remain connected to, to the world in such a remote area. Um, so we thought like having a community network uh, there will definitely have a positive impact of the, in the lives of, of the refugees and, and migrants of, of the community there. Um, for, for just the, in terms of size, we were talking about 500 families, which is about like 1,200 individuals. Um, we were uh, doing our research in the country, trying to find uh, the most uh, accurate partner for, for this project. And we found Colnodo, which is an APC partner. Joseph, you might know them, um, which they have vast experience in implementing uh, such a type of solution in the country, but it was also the first time working in refugee settlements. Um, and um, basically, they are currently um, installing the equipment uh, with the community. They initiated community mobilizations uh, activities two months ago. Uh, basically, they were like explaining to the community every component of the network, how the network work, trying to set the, or like trying to devise like a management, um, like a structure. Um, so yeah, that created like a bit hype around the, the network and, and the community is actually very, very engaged. Um, this project also caught the attention uh, from the private sector, um, specifically from um, Cisco and Ericsson response, um, who were donating power and connectivity equipment um, to this project and also were offering technical support and training um, the communities in how to maintain um, their equipment and, and install them together. So actually Ericsson is now on the ground 
and supporting the installations as well. Um, so we consider that these type of solutions are being uh, basically one of the way forward for sustainability um, and democratizing the access to, to connectivity for, for underserved populations. Over to you, Morten. Thank you so much, uh, Erika, and great uh, uh, to move uh, across the world uh, from uh, uh, from DR Congo and, and Uganda and, and over to, to Colombia uh, uh, in, in, in just a few minutes. Um, I want to pick up on on a recurring theme uh, uh, that 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 you spoke about was was partnerships uh, to to make this happen. Uh, um, it appears that for many of these situations, uh, um, nobody actually uh, will be able to uh, uh, to do this uh, uh, on their own. And and I know uh, Isaac uh, uh, that partnerships are also uh, uh, something that you have been working on both both in in your role in GSMA and previously also in in, in NetHope. And I I wondered if I could invite you to speak a little bit about some of your experiences with, with bringing about connectivity um, through partnerships. Thanks, Martin. Um, first of all, uh, it's great to hear um, Eric, a colleague from UNSCR mentioning the partnership that took place in Uganda, um, enabling uh, building that um, consensus between humanitarian organization and mobile network operators to um, expand network to the most remote area, especially around the Fiji camps or where the displaced populations are. Maybe just to pick up on that before I go into the past examples. Um, so once the coverage has been expanded to the refugee camp and they have access to connectivity, I, I look at that as the, the foundational layer. Um, and then the question becomes, what are they going to do with that connectivity? Um, so I wanted to give two examples of how the, those displaced population, once they got the, the, the connectivity, how they use that, what type of innovation or innovative um, work took place to enable them to really tap in the connectivity that they receive. So we, um, in partnership with uh, both UNHCR, um, MTN, Airtel, Alight, Mercy Corp, and C10, um, in Uganda, the Refugee Fiji camp, um, we did set up a digital community hub, which focused on building, providing the skill set to refugee of all work of life, as well as gender, age to learn how to fix laptop mobile uh, providing them with uh, digital literacy as such that enable them access to job market that were av available there and this work were uh, spearheaded by a partnership through gsma um, mercy corp and c10 c10 is a refugee led um, small local ngo uh, focusing on tech uh, in BDB, the refugee camp. Um, 600 plus graduates of those, I think about 18 or so, after graduation managed to get a jobs within uh, other humanitarian organization as well as mobile network operators, small businesses across the refugee camp. That's one of the effects. Uh, and secondly, in Rwanda, in the Gihembe refugee camp, or near the Hague refugee camp, sorry, um, partnership between, again, UNHCR, KLAB, a local digital skill enabler, Alight, formerly uh, ARC and GSMA, and MTN built uh, after expanding the connectivity to the Nyabihek refugee camp, MTN um, funded or provided uh, about 12 plus 25 uh, desktop installed and KLAB in partnership with Alight and GSMA uh, start initiated a coding school to teach high skilled refugee who are still young, um, new, enabling them to acquire new current skill set in uh, learning how to code um, so that they can also gain access to high paying job market. But critically, once they get relocated in other country, they come with skill set that are very portable to any geography or job market. Uh, going back to 
past experience in the work that led while I was still with NETHO during at the height of uh, European refugee or migration crisis of the 2015 to even now is still ongoing. It was a 2016 uh, as the refugee were embarking from their dingy boat into the mainland Greece. Um, there were a couple of humanitarian organizations there to do the assessment of the situation and one i remember clearly one question that was asked to our father carrying his daughter was would you like water we have water and some food and sandwiches he asked where is germany where can i charge my phone where can i have access to wi-fi now, if you remember those days, the most refugees that made it first were um, middle-class Syrian refugees. So they had access to mobile phone, smartphone devices. Uh, they did not, um, they did not have relevant paperwork to allow them to gain access to SIM card in the country where they come. So KYC requirement was almost out of reach for them. Such that open. Um, our eyes in the sense that if we are able to enable access to connectivity for these refugees, more can be done. And this partnership was led by NetHope, uh, and it was partnership between Microsoft, Cisco, Facebook, Google, Patterson Foundation, and the UNHCR um, to deploy Wi-Fi hotspot, starting with the refugee or migration route where they would gather petrol station as they were crossing throughout uh, the Balkan country into Europe. And then after um, the European Union and uh, Turkey got into a, an agree agreement to kind of close the door, uh, over 70,000 refugees found themselves in the Europe side, in Greece, separated from their family. And that connectivity, access to that connectivity became a lifeline. I remember once in uh, the Viet refugee camp in North Greece, we finalized setting up a connectivity hotspot and a father of 72 years had not spoken to his daughter for the past two years uh got his phone connected launch wife um found his daughter on, on facebook and called him on facebook messenger and they spent two minutes of their conversation not saying anything just crying he brought it to reality that when we say connectivity is as critical as water, food, shelter, so on, medicine, it's, it is actually, it is, because we all are here, <laughs> sitting miles from each other. Um, if my Wi-Fi just went off, then my contribution on this panel would be zero. It's, with COVID, the way COVID has stopped, changed our lives, access to connectivity has been what has maintained economy, the global economy moving forward. Um, and I think um, Martin in Latin discussion will be discussing uh, what is it, what type of business cases need to be put in place so we can really push this forward as that critical basic needs that is becoming a reality currently. Uh, those are a few examples that I thought that uh, uh, I wanted to share, Martin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Isaac. And and what I am realizing here, uh, uh, just leaning back and enjoying the conversation here, is of course uh, what always happens in 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 great uh, company, and it is that that time flies, uh, uh, and so indeed it it does here. Um, so I I think we've. We've covered uh, great ground here. We, we've highlighted uh, uh, communal initiatives, uh, role of, of partnerships. Uh, I've noted uh, a lot of big uh, corporates actually uh, uh, engaging in particularly in the early stage of the crisis, role of mobile network operators, also touched upon some of the challenges and pain points uh, uh, that, are, that are involved. But if I, if I sort of drill down uh, uh, um, and 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 try to 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 sort of frame a question on this, and I want to hand over to to you, Robin, sort of to to take us into to sort of the 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 final stages of this this little uh, debate or or panel around here is that look, these are great examples, right? And 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 it sounds like like a lot of people want to engage uh, and want to do this, uh, yet uh, there are so many people 
who are still unconnected. Uh, so there must be something lacking us. Uh, uh, there must be something around uh, uh, the business case, uh, uh, affordability, uh, the partnerships, uh, and 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 there must also uh, be something that we can do about it. And and if you don't mind, uh, Robin, that uh, tall order, uh, 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 then I would like to hand over to you uh, for for some reflections on that. Uh, 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 in in sort of how do we move forward what are some of the things that we should be addressing as 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 a global community to 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 bring about more connectivity and i'm mindful here that we have about 10 15 minutes left so so i'm going to ask for sort of quick fire uh, uh, uh rounds here okay <laughs> thank you so much well a, a large question i'll do my best to um, first not pretend i have all of the answers but a few quick reflections and one just as i was listening to all of the examples um what's exciting to me is that we're continuing to see so many examples and and, and these examples grow um uh, one observation across each of the examples that um i think is an important factor is just the the, the, the interconnectedness of so many different pieces that are required to make connectivity not just about access to, to the network, but about the, the meaningful use that translates into real value for individuals and, and for economies. Um, Isaac, something that you said about, you know, just starting with the network as the foundational layer, and then what are the elements that you layer upon? I think, uh, Josephine, it may have been you that flagged, it's not just the networks, but there's also the consideration of power. Um, there have been a few other comments in here where, um, and this is a set of characteristics that, or, or uh, excuse me, um, components of the infrastructure that we increasingly talking about, but often can be um, missed when it comes to the, the translation of the access to the network to the meaningful use, which is um, a th three things often come to mind. Number one is um, the question of who who is engaging and, and who are we transacting with on each of the other sides. It's the identity system, the identity platforms, the recognition, again, colleagues have mentioned it, um, the ability to be recognized, to be a, a, a part of this sort of new di digital infrastructure to, to be leveraging. Um, a second is like, what are you exchanging? Those sort of products and services that are moving back and forth. And we've seen governments and other actors investing in things like asset registries to bring physical goods and service into a virtual sort of value and recognition and ownership, of course. Um, um, other areas like addressing systems. One doesn't often think of addressing when you think of the power that e-commerce unlocks and holds for us, but without addressing where do goods move to and from, and we see a lot of um, uh, missed opportunity without it. Um, and finally, this layer of payments. So digital payments is not new to anyone, but how do you actively meaningfully engage uh, in this sort of new virtual um, space with these capabilities um, without having the ability to um, you know, financially transact, and we know access to banking and access to finance has been an issue. So the reason I mention all these layers is because I think one of the challenges has been um, we've had such focus on the technology um, that it's we've gotten to these great solutions where cost of technology has been driven down, the access to these networks, the great examples in the community networks, et cetera, have been there. And then that translation into that, how do we make the meaningful use, which creates the sort of um, you know, to use the private sector language, like where's that return on investment for people who are going to put their money in to make this bigger and, and more expansive, what comes out in the back end? And so the first part I was going to just add is, is I think part of that is a recognition that it requires all of these components working together simultaneously towards a specific goal for a community, for an economy, um, you know, for an industry, um, in order to really bring the, the true value of the network to life. Um, so that was going to be just a first quick thing I mentioned. And then to your point about where I see, uh, where I still see a real challenge, and uh, again, love, the, love these examples, and I think what that sh these the examples show is the proof of concept. I've heard a lot of different types of capital um, referenced. I think I heard some sort of do donations or the philanthropic capital, no expectations of of, of return. Um, and I think that's a really important form of capital to continue to have the experimentation to get these pilots, to get that initial proof of concept, in part because we don't have a lot of flexibly available angel you know, money floating around, particularly in Africa, which is where I've spent most of my uh, past 10, 15 years. Um, and so philanthropic capital can play a real strong role in both experimentation and I think underwriting some of the risk that otherwise um, uh, uh, private capital is, is reluctant to, to step into. Um, and and then, but then as we move from there, one thing I, I also see is we're seeing great examples and as they move into 
starting to prove that there's value in the business model and starting to think about growth, there becomes a complexity of financing that is both um, limiting in terms of the access to capital, in terms of the size, moving from the uh, you know, maybe a couple thousand to a couple millions, one to 10 is often referred to sort of missing middle. The access to that capital um, being limiting, some often say it's easier to raise $100 million than it is to raise you know, one to five to 10, um, but also the high cost of that capital because many investors look at something like TV white spaces and new models for connectivity and don't quite know how to access the real risk of this technology, the effectiveness, the expectation of return on investment because it's new. Um, and so I think there's something there about um, bringing more capital in that's more um, open to risk um, and, and better able to assess that risk in order to create space for the examples we've seen um, that are starting to show results to start to move into that, into that next level. Um, so combination of bringing different kinds of capital together um, and last thing I'll say is like that in, com in conjunction with innovative, flexible regulation that allows for this experimentation to continue to have. Um, I'll just sort of throw that out there as an additional piece and then pause because I know we're very tight on time. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And um, uh, we are uh, a little bit uh, uh, pressed for time uh, uh, here. So, so what I would, what I would, would like to do with the remaining uh, uh, three, four minutes here is to ask uh, uh, Erica, uh, uh, Josephine and, and I second turn um, for just a quick closing remark. And if you wouldn't mind making it uh, forward looking, uh, uh, saying uh, if we need to do more of, of, of what is working, uh, uh, how, how do we do that? Uh, um, and 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 maybe take uh, just uh, uh, a little under a minute uh, each of you to to reflect on that question. Thank you. And and let's start uh, then in reverse order uh, this time uh, with 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 Isaac. How we do that? Um, I think be intentional to know that you cannot do that alone. Uh, strong partnership. Uh, the backbone of these initiatives. But strong partnership without clearly defining the what's in for each partner will not amount to anything. So those um, common benefits, collective benefits need to be flushed out. The, the, the private sector, mobile network operators, terrestrial connectivity companies are a critical part of that. Tech partners are a critical part of that and they would like to do good but the what's in for them need to be determined and defined uh, the humanitarian partners need to flush that out when building this uh, partnership um, so sustainable partnerships with clear business case defined of each player is the only way to go and don't forget the local context also will determine those Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. And, and over to you, uh, Josephine, a uh, quick question uh, uh, and quick reflection. Uh, if we are to do more, uh, uh, for example, from the community-led networks perspective, uh, uh, what, what are the most important things we need to, 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 to get right? Um, I think for me, that would be a more enabling policy and regulatory environment uh, in the telecommunication sector. I um, think uh, with the liberalization and also privatization of the sector, uh, we've seen quite a lot of investments, but uh, we are getting to a point where I think we need to open it up more, especially for other complementary models, such as community networks who are not for profit. Um, and I think at the beginning, they were not uh, envisioned. So more thing, uh, support, especially in licensing, um, licensing community networks, they are there. So they should be recognized in the licensing frameworks, uh, make it more affordable, uh, more affordable access to spectrum and also encouraging uh, spectrum sharing. Thank you, Josephine. Erica, same question, uh, uh, final words, uh, maybe from the humanitarian perspective, uh, uh, what is it that we should do uh, 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 to get more connectivity? Uh, over to you, thank you. 
Thank you, Morten. I think the recent digitalization processes related to, to refugees, um, basically activities and processes have highlighted the need for more meaningful connectivity for, for refugees and migrants. Um, so for me, it will be key to continue giving visibilities to these barriers um, and roadblocks that uh, vulnerable populations are facing among stakeholders. This is government, uh, regulatory authorities, humanitarian organizations, um, to be be able to draw attention and make more sustainable investments in in these areas leading to um, to connectivity solutions um, for for refugees and migrants. Um, in my case, I think also putting uh, the communities at the center of what we do and at the center of the design um, of every connectivity solution is key. Um, not only. For, for humanitarian organizations, but for the communities itself, we have to put their interests and needs um, first. Uh, the innovation service um, is actively working in this space. Uh, we are also providing like targeted financial support and technical support um, to um, UNHCR operations um, in the field and community-based organizations to tackle um, these digital challenges. So these kind of um, initiatives um, to basically provide a space to explore Explore um, and uh, tackle digital challenges from an innovative angle um, is key to, to test new approaches and see what works and what doesn't. I'm just going to put in the chat our digital call for proposals for those who are interested in learning more. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Erica. And, and before I round off, uh, Robin, just on this last round of re reflections, if there's any final words from you uh, on this sort of call to action uh, uh, for, for, for more connectivity through through different types of, 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 of partnerships and business models here. Thank you, Martin. I think my colleagues, <clears throat> excuse me, have covered it so well. So I'll just um, circle back to the, the piece I had uh, just mentioned, which is to complement with um, looking at complementarity of, of capital um, and thinking about different ways to both assess risk and different ways to, different ways to align different types of capital towards um, what I would believe are shared outcomes uh, and, and opportunities. So I'll leave it with the um, creativity of innovative financing uh, and looking at different ways to bring uh, complementary capital together. Well, with that, um, a deep breath uh, here. Uh, uh, um, that was a, a pretty fast-paced uh, uh, tour uh, uh, of the uh, connectivity uh, for for displaced and, and otherwise unconnected uh, people here. Um, I want to thank uh, each of you, uh, Erica, Isaac, uh, Josephine, uh, Robin, for taking the time to share your your great insights uh, with me. And, and the audience. Um, I feel we could have uh, continued this conversation uh, 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 for a lot longer uh, under normal circumstances. Uh, we would be uh, seeing each other uh, in the lobby outside of the uh, event venue here. Um, unfortunately, that's not uh, possible today, but still, thank you so much. Uh, um, I, I look forward to, to picking up uh, with with DRC colleagues and and others on a lot of these these topics that have come out in in this panel uh, at the main stage uh, in just about a minute there is uh, 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 our secretary general and and Tara Nathan from the Mastercard Foundation uh, for the for the final uh, closing session so thanks again for uh, sharing your insights thanks for listening in and and have a great uh, day uh, afternoon uh, evening uh, wherever you may be thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the space. Thank Have you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you to everyone.